I'm going to kick off our first session. As I mentioned, it's about quantum law, current landscape, coming standards, and regulations. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Ryan McKinney from Quantinuum, immediately to my left. Um, this panel is going to focus, as I mentioned, on following laws and policies and issues related to quantum computing. A little bit about Ryan. Ryan is the Associate General Counsel of Compliance and the Director of Government Relations for Quantinuum. It is a leading integrated quantum computing company. And in this role, Ryan works on legal compliance efforts and government affairs policy efforts from Quantinuum's Washington, D.C. office. So I'm going to take this one and hand it off to you guys. Actually, if Jonah and Kanaya want to share that one, I'm going to give this one to you. Great, thanks, Mimi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm Ryan McKinney from Quantinuum, and last year, Kanaya and I had the pleasure of doing a similar session uh, about quantum law, what has come out for regulations, doing a little prognostication, thinking about best practices, and talking about how to you know, liaise with the US government, specifically where government focus is at right now on quantum, where we think that's going, and what that means for the industry. So we're delighted to be back this year and join, joined by Jonah Force Hill from the Lightbridge Group. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, as you said, my name is Jonah Force Hill. Uh, I'm a managing director at a small consulting firm called the Lightbridge Group. Um, I just left the US government after uh, more than a decade, where I worked in various agencies, uh, from the Department of Commerce to the Secret Service, uh, and ultimately in the National Security Council, where I was on the uh, technology and cybersecurity team, um, uh, working under the Deputy National Security Advisor. Um, Worked a lot uh, in coordinating and, and releasing National Security Memorandum 10, which we can speak about, uh, but that is President Biden's order on uh, post-quantum cryptography. So excited to be here with you all today. Thanks, Jonah. I'm Kanaya Kinkoli Tege. I'm the Chief Legal Officer and Senior Vice President of Government Relations for Quantinuum. I'm very excited to be here with my esteemed colleagues. Um, for me, I was a federal attorney for 12 years before I joined Honeywell. Um, and then later Quantinuum as the chief legal officer. I've been in the working in the quantum world, if you will, um, for, oh gosh, since 2017 um, with Honeywell and now Quantinuum. Um, it's been a really exciting opportunity to see the both the ecosystem grow, but also to see the interest of policymakers and regulators and lawmakers around the world. Um, before I hand it back to Ryan, because I always tend to take over, um, could I just see a show of hands of how many folks are maybe lawyers or policymakers? And it's okay if nobody is. It's okay. You, you don't. Awesome. Um, and it's okay. It's, it's all right. It's all right. It's a safe space. You can admit you're a lawyer. It's okay. <laughs> um, so if, the, if we say things or talk about things that might seem a little bit um, confusing, feel free to raise your hand and ask. I know sometimes the law can be a little bit... I won't say boring, but um, it's something that, you know, may be a little bit, um, we'll say, right of center if you're, if you're not used to talking to lawyers. So feel free to raise your hand, ask questions, et cetera. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. Great. Thank you both. So let's dive right in. So one of the great things, I think, about this conference is we focused on international collaboration. We've talked a lot about national strategies, funding, uh, and bringing quantum from the lab to the marketplace. I think when you talk about where government, especially the US government, is at, it's somewhat of a different conversation. Most of what's happened thus far at the federal level has focused on cybersecurity specifically as it relates to quantum. So Jonah, obviously you've worked on NSM 10. Could you talk a little bit about kind of the cyber posture of the US government and what those regulations mean? Yeah, so you know, I think a lot of the ways that uh, lawmakers are introduced, or one of the principal ways that lawmakers are introduced to quantum technologies is through the threat to cryptography. Um, you know, people on the Hill, you know, they understand that there's this new technology, maybe it's under development, maybe, you know, it's already being deployed today. They don't really know what's going on, but they do know, if anything, that there is a uh, long-term threat to the nation's cybersecurity um, from these machines. Uh, and because of that, given sort of the emphasis on risk mitigation among many lawmakers, you know, it's 
um, important for them to be advocating and advancing the U.S. economy, but national security, cybersecurity, the um, integrity of, of critical networks, that's something that really keeps them up at night, and that's true of national security leaders as well. Um, so there is a bit of a push and pull um, in Congress and within the executive branch here in the United States um, between promotion of the technology and ensuring that the United States and our allies are in an advantageous position vis-a-vis uh, -vis these technologies and uh, protecting critical networks, critical infrastructure, national security secrets from exploitation uh, as a result of advances in this tech. So, um, you know, I think if you, everyone should take a look at National Security Memorandum 10 if you haven't already. Um, you know, I think what the administration tried to do was strike that balance of um, acknowledging the risks and developing a plan to mitigate those risks while at the same time putting forth uh, an affirmative statement um, and declaration uh, about the promise of quantum uh, technologies for the nation. Um, so where are we now? Starting in 2016, NIST started a process um, that was an open, multi-stakeholder, industry-led process to develop uh, cryptographic standards that were resilient against uh, future quantum attacks. Um, this has been a, you know, we're at seven years now that this has been going on, um, and NIST, uh, back last year announced that they had selected the winners of their global competition for those standards, or excuse me, for those algorithms, and have now released draft standards uh, which uh, are up for public comment, uh, and we expect in the next few months that those will become standardized within the federal information processing standards regime. So what that means is uh, industry that uh, is required to keep compliant with FIPS will need to integrate these standards into their uh, networks at some point in the near future. Um, that's going to be expensive, it's going to be time consuming, uh, and it's going to be um, deeply challenging. And we've seen from prior examples of cryptographic modernization that can take a decade. And the encryption algorithms that need to be replaced today are much more widespread uh, and embedded into our critical infrastructure than uh, really any prior cryptographic uh, migration ever. Um, so the first movers right now uh, are going to be, at least in the United States, government agencies. Those are the first that are going to actually be going to need to begin to make this transition. And some are already beginning to explore how that might work, taking an inventory of uh, their existing cryptography. Um, and it's slow going, I'll be honest. You know, May 4th was a due date set by the Office of Man Management and Budget to provide an initial inventory of vulnerable cryptographic systems. Um, that has moved uh, not as quickly as we might hope. There's been an extension. Um, so I think it just gives us a little bit of an um, indication of how challenging this is going to be. And for U.S. government agencies, which I think um, share a lot of challenges with private companies, you know, there are a lot of cybersecurity requirements and updates that need to be made. And PQC isn't often at the top of the list. And that's just the reality. There's a move to zero trust. A lot of organizations don't have two-factor authentication. Sort of these baseline cybersecurity hygiene um, updates have not been made by a huge number of organizations. So um, it's going to be a bit of a slog. Uh, but it's important for this community that's really focused on developing um, the technologies themselves to understand that this is really sort of the first step um, in what's going to be a long push and pull between protecting the nation and advancing the technology, and that um, it's really critical for this community to inform and educate lawmakers, policymakers about the opportunities and the benefits that this technology will provide to society and not just the risk. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the motivation for funding, uh, for getting this technology off the ground is coming from the national security imperative. So it's a tightrope that we're gonna need to walk, but one that uh, you know, is critical for getting the kinds of political um, 
uh, kinds of political buy-in that you need to, to see this succeed at a national level. Great, thanks, Jonas. So that's kind of sets the stage, and both NSM 10 and basically everything we've seen at a federal level regarding regulation is centered around national security and walking that tightrope between promoting the industry but also protecting the U.S., uh, particularly against nations of concern. So usually at the top of that list is export controls. So we want to spend a little time talking about export controls and then talk about national security and then we'll move to economic security and promoting the industry. So regarding export controls, over the last 18 months or so, basically since NSM 10 came out in May of 22, a lot of U.S. government officials in the Commerce, Treasury Departments, uh, National Security Advisor have made comments about quantum, usually regarding export controls, maybe coming out soon. Where we sit now, there are no broad export controls on quantum. They're all very tailored towards areas of concern, specifically China and Russia, specific end cases and specific end uses. So that doesn't mean that they won't come out soon. There's a lot of dialogues going on uh, between industry and the government and at different agency levels, but that's where we currently sit. Um, a lot of, uh, even the Undersecretary for Industry and Security last year said if he was a betting person, he would bet that something occurs in this area. So export controls are a major concern. And one reason why that is is because We've talked a lot at this conference about workforce issues uh, and making sure that the U.S. is attracting quantum talent and keeping quantum talent here. This gets particularly difficult regarding export controls if there's not what's called a deemed export issue to make sure that if, you know, a U.S. company hires a foreign national, that that person can, can have the information they need to do that kind of work. Uh, and not be considered an export and could be could lead to uh, incidental non-compliance. So that's kind of a huge piece of the export control conversation that's being had. Um, we're tracking the movement on that, but the workforce issue and that national security issue is driving a lot of those conversations. Um, in terms of what actually has come out at the U.S. government level, back in August, an executive order came out specifically about quantum artificial intelligence and semiconductors regarding foreign investment uh, to countries of concern. Uh, the comment period is actually open until tomorrow for that. I know a lot of quantum companies and quantum coalitions are submitting comments. We really recommend that everyone keep uh, apprised of these types of executive orders and comment periods, work with folks at the Treasury Department, the Commerce Department as they come out to make sure that industry voice is heard, uh, particularly around some of these issues where quantum is particularly unique. Uh, it is still a young ecosystem. The workforce issues are particularly complex. Uh, and the capital expenditures to build quantum computers take a lot of time, money, and expertise. So quantum is different than artificial intelligence, and it is different, different than semiconductors. So making sure that uh, the right decision makers in the U.S. government understand that and are working and hearing industry voices is particularly important. One thing we do want to mention is that that executive order and the uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking on it are, are very tailored. They're tailored towards the end uses and they're tailored towards end users in those countries of concern. So generally, I think from an industry standpoint, I know from, we talked about this at the QEDC level, we really applaud that. That is a very tailored, well thought out regulation and is now taking industry uh, concern via these comments. Uh, and so we look forward to continuing those types of partnerships, but that export control and associated workforce issues will be in a, a large part of kind of U.S. government action uh, in the coming years regarding quantum. So all that being said, national security is, is driving all of these issues. So how do we tie these national security concerns to promoting everything we've talked about at this conference, more international partnerships, more private public partnerships with the U.S. government and driving this further from the lab to the industry. Um, tying some of these cyber concerns that Jonah mentioned to, uh, to the economic viability of the quantum industry is extremely important uh, and it's one that the industry is well positioned to do. So moving from that, I want to kind of segue to Kanaya to talk about that kind of inextricable link between national security, economic security, and what we as an industry can do to continue to kind of push that conversation forward such that regulation, you know, still protects the U.S., um, but also promotes a very viable, robust quantum industry. Thanks, Ryan. 
You know, I kind of like to take this and take what both of them have said and kind of translate it for practical application to a quantum company. What does it mean? So we're Quantinuum. We build hardware. We have algorithm development. We have um, crypt cryptographers doing uh, cybersecurity efforts. We, we like to cover the gamut. But I want to focus on the hardware for a minute because I think that's a really interesting area to start to tease out why some of these issues are really becoming an issue, OK? Um, we have over 900 suppliers, most of whom, like 70 to 80% of them, are overseas. And this is not just unique for our type of technology. This is true for each and every system um, modality that exists. So what do you need to think about if you're sitting as the CEO, if you're sitting as, as kind of the leader of the company, scratching your head saying, I don't really care, why do we care, there's no export control? Well, because of scaling. You have to scale these systems. And whether you're scaling your chip, whether you're scaling your lasers, whether you're doing whatever it is you're doing, you need to be able to have conversations, deep partnership conversations with your supply chain. Most of the modalities have very fragile supply chains. There's one or two suppliers globally who can do the thing that you want to do. And they aren't sitting in this country. This is very similar. You're hearing echoes of what happened years and years ago, right, with semiconductor. You don't have the workforce within the United States to even build up the supply chain needed. You're talking about running just small batch lots of the widget that you might need for your supplier, from your supplier. And you're probably going to have to have some pretty detailed conversations about the specs of what you need, whether it's you need your laser to have, you know, a, um, a phase locking so that, that it doesn't shake as much for those of us liberal arts majors who have to always ask their physicists, what does that mean? It means that you don't want your beam line to move too much from its qubit. You know, whether it is you have to have a more powerful uh, dilution refrigeration system that can continue to, to chill the, the trap or the chip at the bottom. Obviously, I'm the liberal arts major, right? Um, whatever it is, your scientists, your engineers need to be able to have these conversations. And when Ryan mentioned deemed export, right, that is potentially a deemed export in having these various conversations as you send your specs overseas to someone in another country and having these conversations back. So, okay, export control then, if, if we come in and we have these existing laws that, that do exist and they are important, um, you have to go get licenses. You have to understand and navigate your way through a very complex set. That is a hard thing to do for most quantum companies that are extremely small. I think most people know, whether you're in QD QEDC or any of the other associations, we're talking about very, very small pre-revenue-based companies, right? You're, you're scrappy. You're fighting for a lot of things. We were talking earlier. You wear a lot of hats. And so trying to understand what this means, it's, it's a really hard thing. Um, so why did we start with uh, post-quantum cryptography? Why did we start talking about like NSM TIM and cybersecurity? I know when in going to a number of different conferences, you don't seem to hear that very much in the industry, right? We're focused on scaling, on use cases, on how we grow this out. That specter is in, it's in the shadows, right? But it's informing policymakers globally about what they need to do to protect themselves in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if you go to cybersecurity conferences, I had the pleasure of going to um, Israel, actually, in the spring to go to their Cyberdome. And it was a phenomenal experience, and I got to see basically this real-time show of all of the cyber attacks happening around the world, and it is exhausting. I watched it for five minutes, and I thought, oh my gosh, cybersecurity experts are really just trying to survive today. They are not thinking about quantum. And yet, being in this industry, you know this is a real challenge for how you're going to strengthen and harden the various networks, the legacy systems that exist in each and every department and agency, et cetera. So there also needs to be a little bit of a marrying together these two somewhat differing but important areas of quantum because that is informing policymakers. And I say that because at the end of the day, national security is critical. Economic security is equally critical. And I've had the pleasure in sitting in this role at Quantinuum in having offices in the UK, in Germany, and Japan um, having the opportunity to talk to a number of different policymakers and regulators around the world. And one of the things that we're starting to see is strategic funding moving into quantum. Years and years ago, well, okay, that might just be two years ago, but 
year plus year, it's two, right? Um, you know, you would see just general funding for R&D, a line item for quantum. But now you're starting to hear nation states talk about building out the workforce, right? Having strategic investment in supply chain that's gonna be a, an enabler to grow up the ecosystem, to re-domesticate the know-how around the supply chain that feeds into quantum. You're starting to see lawmakers and policymakers get really smart on these issues because in part, they're now paying the price for letting semiconductors move offshore for so many years ago. And they don't wanna see that happen. And I think that's why we are saying, thank you regulators and lawmakers for being smart, for continuing to have the dialogue. But I also wanna take the moment to encourage each and every one of you in whatever role you happen to be, to really, really start to think about how you can continue to inform the dialogue because this really is a big issue that can come very quickly. Um, I saw we have a five minute wrap up, so I will see if anyone else has anything and then maybe we can take a couple questions. Yeah, I think we'll just wrap it up kind of with one point. Obviously, being a, a law panel, we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss the NQIA. Obviously, the NQIA is kind of what started this government focus on, on quantum and has been hugely important to promote research and development. It is due for reauthorization uh, and the deadline is Saturday, September 30th. There may be a government shutdown. We don't know what's going to happen. It may not get authorized until later. All that being said, at these types of conferences in, in the quantum community, it's easy to kind of roll your eyes at the way quantum has become a buzzword. How many times can we see the word intractable problems? How many times do we see shores in a Wall Street Journal article? All of those, the fact that quantum has become such a buzzword is an opportunity to partner with lawmakers to promote, to get the NQIA QIA reauthorized, to look at some of the great legislation that's been introduced this year, like the Quantum Sandbox Act, and to use national security concerns as a wedge to talk about economic security and to talk about the health and the promotion of the industry. Um, so just wanted to mention that about NQIA and open it up and then turn it over to some questions, I think. Yeah, I'll just add, just on, thanks for raising the NQIA. Um, you know, I think it's remarkable, and we should not, um, uh, we, we should uh, notice and recognize how um, crazy it was that only five years ago we had virtually a unanimous bipartisan agreement on the NQI Act. And that is rare in today's Washington. Um, and I think we need to um, continue to build the momentum that was created from the passage of that act and continue to um, to to, dr to leverage the bipartisan consensus that exists on this. And so, you know, both parties recognize um, that this is critical to America's economic and, and national security competitiveness going forward and that um, we should continually remind our law lawmakers that this is important uh, for the nation. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions from the group? You guys were so chatty yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about how we, it's going to take a while for the government itself to become compliant mm -hmm. um, with the new security measures. Mm -hmm. um, on the business side, I am constantly getting reminders of what we're supposed to be doing um, in order to do business with the government. Mm -hmm. um, how do those two things mesh? <laughs> That is a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, so the US government has something, generally, the uh, federal acquisition regulations, the FAR, um, then each agency, because you know we can't be completely standard, um, needs their own. So you have the DFARs, you have the DEER, you have the, I can't remember what NASA does. And they all have slightly different regulations and they do expect you to comply with most of them. Small businesses, there are some occasional opportunities to deviate and then certain types of contracts to allow you to deviate. But that is a great question because that is also something that is getting flowed down and will continue to as the money flows to particular agencies, right, that are very concerned. Um, there is an expectation when you do business with the U.S. government that you are going to meet a certain set of minimum standards. But these minimum standards are quite pricey for companies. Um, again, also something that you don't necessarily have as much in other jurisdictions. Um, which one of the things I try to encourage folks when I talk to them um, in, in the government is to find 
additional ways to help small companies start. Cyber contracts and things like that, they're, they're hard. They're hard for companies to really gain traction here. Um, but yeah, that is something that you will continue to see is the expectation of having the right IT infrastructure, the right CAS compliant accounting systems and all of that, that general infrastructure to just be able to truly do business with the US government. All right, I'm so sorry we're running short on time, but hopefully, Naya, Jonah, and Ryan might be available afterwards if folks want to come up and continue conversations with them. But for now, please help me to thank the three of them for this great conversation.